Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. Today's guest is David McCraney, an internationally best-selling author, journalist and lecturer who created the You Are Not So Smart blog, books and podcast. David, who lives in Mississippi, cut his teeth covering Hurricane Katrina on the Gulf Coast and across the Deep South. Since then, he's been a beat reporter, editor, photographer, voiceover artist and television host. Before that, he had a, a varied working life waiting tables, working construction, uh, selling leather coats, building and installing electrical control panels and owning pet stores. He's here to talk to us today about his latest book, uh, How to Beat Your Brain, an attempt to help us overcome our quirks and to think more effectively. Hello, David. Welcome to the Middle Way Society podcast. Oh, man. I don't, I don't believe any of that really happened when I hear it out <laughs> loud like that. <laughs> But thanks for having me. Thank you. Oh, no, it's great. Great you're here. Okay, can you start by telling us a bit about your background, David, and what prompted you to to write the book? Uh, well, it came about because I I went to – when I decided to actually go get a formal education, I was – I thought I was going to be a psychologist, and I was taking all those classes and doing all that coursework and doing all that clinical work, and then I – I wrote, started writing some opinion pieces for the, the college newspaper, and I realized uh, that I really like really liked doing that. And I started to, uh, I moved my way up through the ranks of that, I became the editor of the newspaper, and I just sort of switched over to journalism. And I changed my degree, so that's what I did in my professional life for the first few years. And I was working for newspapers, and then I worked my way up to working as an editor, and I just sort of stopped writing once you become an editor yeah. and I had just wanted to go back to writing it was my original passion so I thought that I would like to start a blog but I didn't know I didn't want to start a blog just about uh you know today it would be like Instagram or or uh Tumblr or Twitter where you would just talk about what you were doing that's how blogs were back then in 2009 I just thought there there was a sort of a rash of micro topic blogs, really thin slice blogs. There were blogs about very specific things. And the one that most inspired me was stuff white people like, and uh, which was a blog that was basically making fun of middle upper class white people in the United States and the kind of things that they do and, and sort of almost doing like a anthropological study of them, but in a funny way. Yeah. So I, um, I wanted to make a blog that was as specific as that. And I thought, well, I have all this stuff in psychology that I like to bore people with but also try to shock them with at um, on long trips and at parties and stuff like that. So the stuff that always seems to get the most traction from the psychology that I knew about was stuff about um, how overconfident we are in our ability to understand our own perceptions or, or thought processes or the origins of our emotions. So um, that was what I decided to make a blog about. And that's how the whole thing got started. And it got really popular really quickly thanks to some strange – events one being i wrote one of the first posts was about brand loyalty and in that post i talked about the difference between why somebody would like apple versus uh android or apple versus microsoft and why they would like sort of defend that almost like a political party or something and that just sort of coincided with an event in the news where the an iphone prototype had been stolen by a by a, a blog and and it was all over the news. And that blog actually asked if they could republish one of my posts. And when I told them they could, that just sort of – that was when everything exploded for me. It got That's where I got my first big uh, sort of uh, avalanche of attention. And what followed from that was more and more posts and eventually a an offer to turn it into a book. And then that book became a second book and then a podcast. And so that's where the whole thing came from. Okay, well – can you give us a, a quick overview of the book um, and what your main objectives were uh, with uh, how to how to beat? We call it in the UK how to beat your brain. I think it's got a different title in the US, hasn't it? Yeah, in the US it's um, it's uh, you are now less dumb. So it's like a, it's a companion. You are not so smart. You are now less dumb. Uh, sometimes publishers will change titles because they just were a little bit concerned that maybe um, some people would not 
get the, you know in America dumb is is used all the time to mean mm. stupid idiot you know whatever but the um uh fool moron that kind of thing but in the UK as i was told that in some places in the UK dumb still means uh mute yes, so yeah. they they were just uh they were just worried there might be some sort of confusion there so they changed the name to how you to uh how you to how to beat your brain okay so well um so what were your main objectives then when you you set out to write it i mean for example one of the things i really loved about the book was it's it was such a um an easy read. I, I don't mean I don't mean lightly, but I mean I I because I, I read I've read stuff on cognitive bias and heuristics before, like Danny Danny Kahneman's book, which is a great book. But oh yeah, you know, yeah, it's a challenging book too. Whereas this yours was um was really fun to read, and was that a, a real focus for you to make it accessible to a wider audience? I I ax that was all an accident, but but once I realized that was one of the selling points of my approach, I worked hard to make that work. So I figured that out with the blog. It's kind of weird. Like the Daniel Kahneman book came out the month after my book came out. And, um, you know, at first I thought, Oh no, like this is the worst timing ever. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy, you know, of course that Daniel Kahneman wrote, wrote a book. He's like one of my greatest heroes. And, um, so much of what I wrote about, you know, was trying to translate his work and others. But the, I realized, you know, years later, I realized that my book is the coffee table you know my, my book is the cocktail party coffee table version of his of his book so like hopefully hopefully a lot of people would read my book and they would move on to more difficult books like his but what ended up happening was i was um since i worked in journalism i worked in online journalism a lot and that was a lot of what my uh focus was in school i was very aware that i i wanted for a subject like this i wanted it to make i wanted to give people several stages several stages by which they could slowly be seduced by the topic. So at first you get, uh, and I'm trying to meet the reader halfway. So first of all, you get the name of it and then you get this sort of pseudo headline yeah. where I tell you the, the, uh, the misconception and then the truth. And, and then usually there's a very short introductory paragraph. So the idea is that by the time you actually start reading about the subject, you've gotten a pretty good bit of information so that it's not so difficult to digest. And then it was very important for me to write about each one of these in a very um, funny and sort of uh, a little bit of um, I, I must I almost always I will always write in second person. So it's always talking directly to the reader. I try to um, the voice is always a little bit condescending, but also funny so that you realize that uh, I'm trying to I'm always trying to win you back from. I mean, I've already told you you are not so smart, so I have to try to win <laughs> you back. And all that kind of comes together into making it a lot easier to understand this stuff. And, and I put a lot of pop culture references and yeah. I just try to make it, you know, I was imagining the typical person who would read this book. I was hoping would be someone who had never in their life thought about any of this and it would be really shocking. And so I was truly hoping that I could give you a lot of sugar to get this medicine to go down. So that's, that's where all the approach came from. And if you, when you move on to the next book, it's a little more dense. It's a little, it, it's a little more narrative and uh, not as bite-sized, but it's still kind of got that voice to it. The the new book that I'm working on will be a bit more, uh, I guess, uh, academic than the others have been. But this, these first two have been, the idea has really been, uh, hopefully I could get a lot of people uh, turned on to this sort of stuff. Well, that, that certainly came across, David. Okay. So um, what's the difference then between well, you talk in the book about biases and heuristics and fallacies. Can we just unpack this a little bit? What's the difference between a, a bias and a heuristic? Well, a bias, uh, you know, is a tendency to think in one way and not another. So for a lot of the things that we do day to day or think day to day or feel day to day, if it's being managed by the brain and all the hormones that affect it, um, there will be some, there will be cultural influences to that. There will be environmental influences. But for a lot of the things that we we think and, and do and feel, they come prepackaged with every human brain because they have some sort of uh, they've been selected against over time by evolution and natural selection has led us to think more in one direction than in another. So we are naturally biased cognitively to have a sort of predictable pattern of thought when we unconsciously fall back on the default positions that the brain holds for certain situations. So one example, one simple example would just simply be, you know, being fearful of high places or fearful of dark, dark places or of strangers or of spiders or snakes, that sort of thing. So, you know, we're biased in that direction already. We didn't, we don't get to sit down and, and with a spreadsheet and say, should I, or should I not be scared of this thing? Um, 
but it also they also tend to pop up in really strange situations where we are also biased toward confirmation of uh, of our hypotheses. So if if we observe something in nature and then we um, don't really know what the source of that thing is, we don't know the antecedent to the thing that we've just witnessed. We uh, naturally form a hypothesis right there in the moment, but we don't know that it's a hypothesis. We we uh, we don't think in those terms naturally, so we tend to simply draw a conclusion, and then when we try to test that uh, hypothesis against uh, what we learn in the future, we tend to do so in a confirmatory manner. So we will, um, whenever we find evidence that seems to support our conclusion, we pay attention to it, and we find evidence that seems to not support our conclusion, we tend to fight it or ignore it, and it sort of leads us down this biased path toward confirming everything that we believe and think and feel. And uh, that's just a natural thing that all human beings do. I mean, d every culture will either enhance or it will suppress our natural bias in that direction, but we all do it. And there are psychology and neuroscience, they've sort of cataloged and quantified. Um, I think the last time I checked, there were like 300 and some odd. There, there's a lot of them. There's, there's yeah. more than there's several hundred. And uh, I'm sure there will be many more. And some of them are combinations of others and some of them are bits and pieces of others but there's a whole lot out there to suggest that we are just sort of riddled with um these default ways of thinking and most of them are good most of them i mean the the, the purpose of of you know if you want to talk in those terms but the idea is that they're all functional they they in the situation in which they were selected against, they're very functional. And it's it typically is better to think in a confirmatory way in the situations that we used to usually find ourselves in. So, you know, if you're looking for your keys, um, I had a scientist tell me this once, if you were looking for your keys, you wouldn't start the search, you know, 500 miles away, you would start the search in your kitchen. Yeah. And it's so and because that's where you think they are, and you try to work to confirm that assumption. So it's actually useful. But it gets really tricky when say you think that vaccines are cause autism or you thought or you think that the moon landing was a hoax yeah. if you use that same confirmatory thinking about topics like that it'll get you in trouble so my books like to talk about how these these things while they often serve as well can really get us into trouble and that's the part that i like to talk about and heuristics how they how do the biases different from heuristics so a, a, heur, a heuristic is any time that the um the brain trades accuracy for speed so it's usually important for most organisms to uh, react very quickly to information that's coming in. And uh, the human brain is no different. So heuristics make it possible to have a, a very big, complex, and uh, daunting idea or decision or judgment be reduced down to a uh, almost an if-then statement or uh, a rule of thumb. And some heuristics we get naturally and some we we build up over time through learning uh, a good example would be the farther something is away from you the blurrier the blurrier it is and the closer something is to you the the more clarity there is so you could almost say that this we have a clarity heuristic or and it's a it's a rule of thumb so that yeah. we don't we don't actually have to take out some measuring tape and measure how far away something is from us if we see a mountain and it's a little blurry in our vision our brain just simply and it indicates to us this is distant. Now, that serves us well in most situations. But if you were to jump into a swimming pool and you thought that the uh, you were jumping into deep water because it seemed like the water was blurry underneath and you hit your head on the bottom, then you just fought, fell victim to using a heuristic when you needed to actually do some measuring. So by trading that accuracy for speed, you can assume that things – you can assume some things are distant that are actually very near. Same thing if you're driving and – um it was very foggy and the car seems like it was farther away because it's foggy. So heuristics basically speed up thought. They're rules of thumb. Uh, they're un, you know, you unconsciously do these things. All those examples with the blurriness and the clarity that came from the original work done by um, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. And because they are sort of um, – they're very similar to biases in that most of the time they work well and we don't notice they're working. But when they are incorrect and – when we trade accuracy for speed and we get something very, very wrong, that's when they can cause us harm. So that's the big difference between a heuristic and a bias. Okay. And then you also talk about logical fallacies in the book. Now, you could arguably say biases come more from the field of psychology and fallacies, maybe, well, the origin is philosophy, etc. But what, what would you say they have in common? 
I like to think of the uh, so I I subscribe to this uh, concept, the argumentation uh, theory, which is sort of um, the idea that a lot of reasonings, a lot of what reason does for us is give us the ability to argue with ourselves and with other people. Yeah. And we sort of make, we, we make sense of the world through argumentation, whether or not we realize that it's structured in that way. And so like politics and, and science are sort of these organizational tools we've created to make arguing more uh, profitable for us to give it to you know, that delivers more um, of what it helps us uh, organize our argumentation so that it is more beneficial than just straight up bickering with somebody. But whenever um, everyone sort of walks around the world with a model of reality that's constructed from experience and culture and, and, and uh, evolution and that when that model of reality is threatened in any way, we tend to sort of start forming an argument in our mind as to how um, how we can best preserve our existing model. And so whenever we argue with someone in that way, whether, and sometimes it's with our own selves, uh, argumentation follows rules of logic, just like a computer program or a math puzzle. And if you get your steps turned around and you don't realize it, you can fall into a logical fallacy. And basically if a heuristic or a bias gets challenged, and that is the point at which you will get argumentation and if you argue poorly, you will fall into a fallacy and not realize that you're doing so. So that's sort of how they are bound together. So the logical fallacies are sort of a, a, a almost a binding agent for uh, biases and heuristics. And together they form my trinity of uh, self-delusion. <laughs> so um, am I right in saying that there's a sort of fixity or repression of alternatives going on with both biases and, and fallacies. Oh yeah. I think that, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. The, you know, your brain is a certainty generating machine, uh, and, and, and it's a, a meaning seeking machine and uncertainty is almost always maladaptive. So, and so is meaninglessness. And so most brains would rather, draw a conclusion quickly and stick to it, then remain doubtful or get stuck in some sort of neutral static situation. And there's a trade off there, but it would appear, you know, we have to speculate that over our long evolutionary history, especially in the last 3 million years or so, it's been more beneficial for us to draw conclusions quickly and stick to them than it has been to linger in doubt or to ruminate over ideas. Like we now have the freedom and the, and we now are afforded that opportunity by um, the lives that we live in as a modern human being. But it was better to just simply say, you know, if a vine falls out of the tree and lands on your head, you assume it's a snake and you run and that's the way you live your life. <laughs> and you can, and you can use that as a metaphor, uh, you know, all the way through higher types of reasoning, but, and that's fine until we are able to press a button and launch a missile or we're able to, you know, ruin the lives of millions of strangers with weird financial decisions at high levels of mark. Like once you give a, this, this brain, the opportunity to really cause harm to lots of people and lots of strangers, all those things that were adaptive now become maladaptive. And so yeah. we're in that, we're in that strange gray period of time where we're trying to, I mean, what's fantastic to me is that since Kahneman and me and a bunch of other people have been writing about this, we have entered into a period of time where we're watching a, a, a new generation of people and then and then a lot of other people who just simply are staying informed um all the old rules of logic are coming back and uh people are starting to become very interested in sort of greek notions of argumentation and and become interested in the idea that um we shouldn't assume that we're going to uh, the, the better angels of our nature are going to win out we should assume that we have to protect ourselves against ourselves instead of assuming we'll do the right thing every time so that's sort of for me, that's the good outcome of all this is that is the more you learn about this, the more you tilt in that direction of, of, of being aware that we're very flawed. And there's a, there's a real humility. And uh, uh, to me, there's almost a, a sense of community that comes from accepting that we're all in this together and that we're all sort of quirky and messed up in this way. So I, I, that's what I dig most about it. Yeah. Well, we certainly aspire to that sentiment too, um, David. And, and, um, on the subject of certainty, which you, you just brought up, would you say metaphysical beliefs are a form of cognitive error? You know, I don't know. So the, like the, the error part is like it's a weird 
it's weird. I've been asked by some scientists to try to to to, to move away from using the word error. Okay. To move away from or to move away from thinking of these things as being um, broken, you know, and just simply look at them as being, uh, you know, they're they're meant for one thing, and then they get put in situations they ought not be in. Um, I think when it comes to metaphysical belief or religion or anything like that, um, you know, the, there's always a way to look at it where we can try to reverse engineer it and say, where did this come from and what is it doing for us? You know, it's maybe it's uh, an overactive agency detection system where, you know, the rustling in the leaves might be a tiger. So we always assume it is. And therefore we never, we never turn off our agency detection. So when things happen to us that are outside of our control or outside of our understanding, we always default to there must be an agent behind it. And that's where, uh, you know, gods come from. Um, or there's, you know, the anthrop anthropological ideas of um, religion is something like religion is always going to rise up when uh, human beings start having to survive based off of the success or failure of uh, group cohesion and um, and cultural selection, yada, yada, yada. So there's all sorts of, I think, ways we could talk about the nuts and bolts of where incubation chambers for metaphysical beliefs come from. But when it comes to actual metaphysical belief, I think that that's more, for me personally, it's just more of that is part of the, that's part of the calculus of how the brain makes sense of any, of anything and how we may, how we create, how we generate thoughts and look at them. I wouldn't look at it as an error unless, <laughs> unless it makes life suck for you and other people. Yeah. Um, other, you know, if it's a purely philosophical, uh, meandering there's nothing wrong with that but uh if it results in real world suffering and harm then i would start to lead more in the direction of this is an error and we should correct for it and we should build institutions that allow us an opportunity to correct for it which is what is great for me about having science as its own entity and not allowing this weird blending that sometimes takes place in the united states in academia where there's you know teach the controversy and stuff like that it's really much better to just simply look at science as a tool and, and there's a process and, you know, whatever goes in that machine and comes out uh, whole is what we deal with. And if anything that doesn't, we just, you know, move on to another realm. So if that's, I know that's, that's a very political way to answer that question, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 I've lived in the, um, I've lived in the Bible belt for, for a number of years. So I, I'm used to being able to get, get through that question in a, in a weird <laughs> gymnastic kind of way. <laughs> okay. Um, well, We've talked about Daniel Kahneman, who arguably brought these biases, heuristics and fallacies to, along with you, you know, to, to a much wider audience uh, through through the book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. But, but he he was, I don't know if to say pessimistic, but he's, his view was that it was quite limited what we can do in response to them. Now, now your book, you, you seem to be more, you seem to offer more practical advice, more positive in are you in, in a, to an extent challenging that view that we, we that we can do something about these things? You know, the, when you look, think of the title, how to beat your brain. <laughs> right. I, I do. Yeah. I think that, um, so my position on this, it's not too much different from Kahneman and, uh, and, and I really recommend everyone uh, you, you go back and find his original stuff with, um, Tversky. It's uh, judgment under uncertainty. You can find the, the, all those original uh, papers and, he identifies the representativeness heuristic and all sorts of other things that uh, he, he sort of starts out with like a very small pool of ideas, like five or six heuristics. And then the, this whole wing of psychology was built on top of that. Um, I do think that uh, you have to accept it. Like this is the way I think of it. Okay. Okay. We have two legs and you know, the reason we have two legs and the reason that we walk upright, there's this whole pedigree behind why that happened. And, um, all these evolutionary forces brought us into this place where we're walking around on two legs. So then at, at some point in time, we build, a, we build cars. So we build cars that basically, you know, you sit down in them and there has, and you work, you work the pedals with your feet. So we built a car around the existing um, biological limitations and the physiological form that is the human body. We didn't build a car for people that have six legs. We didn't build a car that you operate with, uh, you know, tentacles. We built a car that is designed to deal with the form that is the human being and all of its limitations. The thing is, 
we should be building institutions and organizations and personal lives around the mind that's generated by the brain. And there, and that mind is flawed in very specific ways. It's limited in very specific ways. Now, until you know about these biases and fallacies and these heuristics, most people have no idea they exist. And not even that, they actively assume that they don't exist at all. And they are smarter than this and better than this and that they remember everything that happens and that um, they remember, they see everything that happens in front of them and they have a perfect memory and that um, they would always make the best financial decision. There's all these things that we assume about ourselves. We always have this very rosy concept of how we would perform in one task to another that doesn't match up with what the research says. Sure. And as a result of it, we tend to build institutions that also assume that we will always operate as, uh, you know, these brilliant <laughs> beings of light and uh, and logic and reason. And it's just not how we really are. So I think that is just as with a pilot doesn't trust his or herself to fly the plane perfectly and has to go through an actual written checklist and has to have an, another person there, make sure that that person's gone through that checklist. You know, they, and the same way with a surgeon or um, uh, anyone who's tasked with something that ha that puts the lives of others in their hands, I think, and I'm, I'm sure we're moving toward that is that, you can't stop yourself. You can't remove confirmation bias from the human brain. And because, and so what we did is we invented science. And science is this disconfirmatory structure yeah. for making sense of the world. You can't remove the representativeness heuristic from the human brain. So you have to build institutions that account for um, prejudice and account for racism and sexism and that sort of thing. So my opinion is that, no, you can't get rid of any of this stuff. That's ridiculous. But – uh, you can create a world that takes all of this into account and protects us from our own uh, problems, saves us from ourselves. The same way you would you wouldn't trust your kid to run around the house and not stick a penny in a light socket. It, you instead, buy things that keep him from putting stuff in light sockets. And then you know, that's the kind of world that I think we should generate from this. So I, I agree with Kahneman on one side, but I also think it's completely possible to make to make a world that is um, and and to have a personal life in which you take all this stuff into account and it doesn't harm you that much. Sure. OK, well, I'm going to ask you a, a bit more of a philosophical question now, um, David. To what extent, you know, because they're very pernicious things, these uh, biases and fallacies and heuristics, but, but to what extent are we responsible for them? I mean, arguably the deterministic position would be that we, we have no responsibility, whereas the libertarian position would be that we, you know, we could completely dispense with them through a, a mere act of will. Where, where do oh, you yeah. position yourself on that spectrum? Oh, yeah. I, I think that um, the libertarian position on most everything is deeply, deeply harmed by the uh, evidence produced by this side of psychology and this side of neuroscience. Um, I'm not a I personally am not a big advocate for letting people um, for giving people that kind of freedom because we're not capable of self-regulation on that level. So, you know, we can't be these beautiful Spock like beings that do the right thing every time. If we, if we were, that would be great, but uh, I don't think people work that way. So the more we learn about this side of human psychology and the more evidence and the more it's quantified, I think the more responsibility we, um, the more it, evident it becomes that we have a responsibility to make sure that this stuff doesn't harm people. Sure. So if, if you, if you know that you can prevent another, stock market crash and housing crisis by treating people or well, a, a, a really good example would just be cars, you know, like, um, like it's probably true that human beings should never have been given the ability to drive cars around because we're just really, <laughs> really, really bad at it. And it's one of the number one ways that people die and, um, car crashes happen every day and they're horrifying and horrible. And it really would be a much better world if, if, we had self-driving cars and I can imagine a future where we look back in time and go, Oh my God, I can't believe we, we let everybody drive cars for as long as we did. That was a really stupid decision. So I think that there's examples of that all throughout the humanity in that we are, um, unfettered freedom is a really strange thing to hand over to such a flawed organism. And I, I know, and one of our greatest flaws is assuming that, that we should be allowed that kind of responsibility because we're, because we're going to be great at, at dealing with it. So yeah, I'm on the side of, um, of regular, of creating a regulated world that protects us from ourselves. And I, and I know that the libertarian 
a libertarian would hear that and just uh, just spit out whatever they're drinking because that's so <laughs> – like how dare you in your nanny state? But um, I think that human beings left unchecked will make some incredibly horrible decisions and some credi- incredibly incorrect judgments, and those things will lead to harm. And there's a way of, of not taking away people's um, – freedom and 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 a way of of also respecting free will that is um informed by science and allows for a simple just giving people an opportunity to be better at self-regulation i think there's nothing wrong with that sure so so if i could just try and summarize that in a way then uh, so um if you think about the scientific method arguably um they already have strategies in place that you know with prior preparation and training to um try and counteract these cognitive biases for example double blind trialing in medical research you know has that goal of avoiding confirmation bias so so if so just like if someone carries a fragile object carelessly and then breaks it uh, you, you know we, we're usually inclined to hold them to a degree responsible for that breakage could it then also be argued that if we make cognitive judgments carelessly because we have failed to prepare or train ourselves in advance in ways that might have improved those cognitive judgments we are responsible then at least to a, a small extent for those judgments it's a that's a tough question i don't know um because like you take for instance eyewitness testimony so eyewitness testimony is conceived of and put into practice in the legal system in a pre-scientific era, it, and, the, and it's still present today. Now we know that uh, very cl- it's it's absolutely clear to us now that eyewitness testimony is is almost completely worthless. Yeah, and it's not it's not just worthless; it's harmful. Um, if you, for instance, show someone a picture of a suspect and then you uh, you know ask them to uh, identify that suspect in a lineup. It, it, there, there are so many ways that you can force a participant's hand so that they will pick someone in a, in a lineup, right? Yeah. Um, it's really weird. You know, in studies where they, they'll, they'll show somebody committing a crime and then they show a police lineup and say, pick the perpetrator. Everyone picks someone. <laughs> no one ever says, I don't see the, I don't see the, the criminal in the lineup. And yeah. so they'll do, they'll do studies where they actually don't have the person that's in the video in the lineup. They just have people that all have the same hair color and height and everything. So, I mean, that's what happens in the real world and police do it. Uh, people who have suffered and who've actually been the, you know, on the receiving end of the crime will do it. We just know that, that um, we just know that eyewitness testimony is awful and it ca- not only is it bad, but it causes harm. Now, now that before we knew that was true, I don't know how much culpability there was. I don't know what, you know, this, no one understood it. So it's, it's, there was real harm being done by it. And there was real uh, injustice being caused because of this um, blind sort of faith in this concept. But now that the, the science is out there, I'm not sure. You know, I don't, I don't, I, I think that it definitely is, it is really, there is an onus on, people who are either scientists or science communicators to get that information into the legal system. And I think once it's out, once it's inside the legal system, there is a huge uh, responsibility for the people who can affect change to change it and uh, doing nothing at all. I don't know. It just seems, it seems really wrong to not do something, how much culpability there is and what we should do to the people in the past or how we should look at them. I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's prickly for me, yeah. but I do know that I do know that it, it seems now that we are totally aware that this that this particular thing is bad, it should be. And people like David Eagleman are working very, very diligently to try to change the legal system to fall in line with our understanding of science. I know in my home state, they were using um, bite mark analysis a lot in trials. Uh, this, uh, this idea that you can uh, do an impression of someone's teeth and match it to someone's bite on like their arm or something and, and like – figure out who the person was like it's only been in the that was used for so long and it was never tested like scientifically to see if it even worked and then once it was put through the crucible of the scientific method it was shown that this is is you can't do that you actually can't like match people's teeth to bite marks on for body parts and stuff and and so then oddly enough there's like 10 years of of um 
of struggle to now pull that back out of the legal system, to pull that out of forensics and say, no, don't do that anymore. It's really strange because it's like put it into practice, find out it doesn't work and then remove it from uh, where it's being used incorrectly. You would think that it would be like, uh, hey, that doesn't work. And the scientist is telling me that it doesn't work. And then they'd be like, well, let's not do that anymore. But that's totally not how it, how it worked. <laughs> the, there's usually quite a struggle between getting the, getting the disconfirmatory evidence and then applying it to the real world. And I find that it's very frustrating. And so to the long answer to your question is I just don't know. It seems, yeah. it seems fraught because, you know, how – responsible are we if we're completely ignorant of our of our own ignorance i'm not sure yeah but i suppose what i was, what I was trying to get at, I'm, I'm just trying to think this through actually is you know we're talking about the scientific method and how effective it is to, uh, about making good decisions so you, you know you've got a theory you um you try to falsify you try to look for disconfirmation and through that then you get a better model of your theory you know you you, you so you, ha you have to modify your theory or potentially even ditch it but whatever the, is the case then you get a better theory you know rather than the confirmation bias the sort of loop where you, you have a theory you're trying to confirm it and then you know that it, it's, right. it's limited in, in that way but i suppose what i'm wondering is it seems such an effective strategy that whether um you can apply that to more everyday moral decisions you know you have a problem with your, someone at work or something and and you look at it and you think uh, and you try and look at the the processes are going on and try and disconfirm the belief that you've had and if it holds up great and if if not then you have to adjust your theory and then you get a better theory do you think do you think it's fit for purpose that sort of uh, strategy for for more general moral decisions i think so i think i mean there, we have to be careful with it but i think for almost everything that we do that's you know that is the tool by which you make a better decision like that's the tool by which you make a better judgment because it's the fundamental idea is simply try disconfirm your assumption and see what happens after that and it's it is not the natural way that we think the whole reason we had to invent science was because the way we naturally think is completely upside down from that and there's so many examples throughout history there's so many there's so many um superseded scientific theories whether it's uh you know um spontaneous generation or it's um the uh believing that miasmas you know the gases in the air smells cause you know uh cholera that kind of weird stuff like that you know those things persisted for generations because it was um one of my favorite examples is uh the goose tree um for at least 700 years learned scholars believed that geese grew on trees like the bird <laughs> because uh because they were absent most of the year and um during the time that they were absent barnacles that kind of looked like geese would float up on shore and they just sort of like connected the two and they assumed that the barnacles were geese that hadn't fully grown and they uh fell off like the branch fell off before it was uh the pod flew away or whatever now the, the real reason of course was migration and they didn't know what migration was and so they just came up with this sort of post hoc explanation that seemed to make sense and that made sense long enough uh so i think that the scientific method in just just straight up observe hypothesis, test your hypothesis with an eye toward disconfirmation, see what comes out of it. Yes, that's the best way to handle almost everything. Even public policies are probably better handled in that way. But there's two caveats to that. One is that when you start thinking that way, you start thinking that, well, then the purely logical, rational path is the best path. And this is not true because uh, there's a great um, neuroscientist, Damasio, yeah. who showed that when you have people who've had the emotional part of their brain all scrambled up and they, for different reasons, they have strokes or lesions or whatever, uh, head injuries. When you get a purely logical person, when you actually get a data or a Spock, when you actually get one of these people, they are paralyzed. They cannot do anything because they can make no decisions. And, and the reason is the tiebreaker in our mind for every single thing that we do is emotional. The yeah. reason we, Everything we've ever chosen in our entire life, it was put over the over the edge, w weighted down more than the other decision through some sort of emotional reaction. Yeah. And you hand one, you know, with Demasio, you ha he'd have subjects. You'd be like, "Hey, pick pick which cereal you want to eat for breakfast tomorrow." This becomes a three hours of torture for this person. I mean, they have to sit down and write out how many calories and what does it 
taste in it? How crunchy is it? Is it worth my time? And how much volume? And this becomes this purely logical thing. Is hell. We don't do that. Like the reason you vote for A or B, the reason you have the job you have, the reason you drive the car you drive, the re- all of this stuff is a purely emotional decision. So that's one reason you have to take that into account. So sure, yeah. use use the scientific method for those things that it would be best it would best be served to use it that way and be careful about it, trying to use it for which pin should i use to read that yeah. so they are and the other caveat is that um, could, could i just jump in there a second though yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I i absolutely agree with that i mean um and i think that his work is wonderful that because he, he basically says that if you um if you block out you know the emotional system of your brain you can't set goals you you um you, you don't know what to want basically but sure. then I still think in, in many ways you can in acknowledgement of that knowing that this is a very false dichotomy the separation of emotion and re- reason that with any decision we make we have to build in our psychological limitations we we have to recognize uh, um, our limits basically and I don't see why when trying to make a, a judgment that that you know this idea of pure objectivity like a god's eye viewer thing it doesn't exist mm-hmm. you know um, right sure uh, yeah. but anyway so i agree with that but uh, but i still think you can build that into um making decisions and trying trying to falsify them thinking emotionally and rationally together you can't separate the two i, I yeah i totally agree and and, and that's one of the, my biggest like I spend some time with the skeptics community in what I do, and, and I, you know, I walk in some of the similar worlds and do some of the similar stuff. And I've had many of them on the show and lots of conversations. And um, I think most of the people understand what we're saying, but a lot of people who sort of are just who, when they first get into that community and they get uh, sort of seduced by the promise of it, there is this tendency to to want to put emotion on one side and reason on the other and say that the best kind of person is the person that gets away from their emotions and gets, you know, it becomes a purely logical creature. And um, I could totally understand that when I was younger, I would have thought stuff like that, yeah. but it's amazing to see that when you get, when you actually get a purely logical human, they are worthless. They can't do anything. They live in this hellscape of un- being unable to, <laughs> to live. And um, so, you know, and, and what's weird is I spoke to a psychologist um, for the podcast a while back and she was really an advocate for embracing that in your decision making process. And her way of getting the two things to um, to mesh together was say, like, if you're trying to buy a new home, um, do your uh, your purely logical, rational research or whatever and get it down to three choices. And then the next day, wake up and pick the first one that feels good and then just and then and then commit to it. And her idea was that, you know, the the decision in the end is always going to be emotional and you're just going to torture yourself if you try to make this perfect decision try try to just try to simply use the rational side of of your of your psyche to reduce the pool of possible outcomes to a to a small number and then commit emotionally to that last bit so that was her way of of, of solving the problem oh i like that and okay what was the what was the second caveat the other caveat is is um you know a lot of kahneman skinner uh, uh, Milgram, all of the great psych- psychologists and their experiments uh, all exist in this w- inside of a cultural bias toward um, Western minds. And as psychology moves forward, it's become it's becoming more and more aware of this, and it's baking it into the research. But we have to always be aware that the best thing for any one mind is going to be the best thing for that kind of mind. It's this is kind of weird and. It kind of is a, has a snake eating its tail quality to it. So, the good example of this is um, self-esteem. So, in the United States, particularly, but in a lot of Western cultures, uh, self-esteem is considered a good. It's considered a universal good, and that we should all have high self-esteem. We should do the things that give us high self-esteem, and if we have low self-esteem, we should do something about it. And we read books about it. We have there. We go to conferences and lectures and seminars and High self-esteem is just something we look at as being the ideal, and the opposite of that is something we should avoid. So is that true? Well, yes and no, because 
a person from the United States who has high self-esteem will also have low, low blood pressure. A person that has high self-esteem in the United States will be happier and more effective and make more money and, generally speaking, just be a healthier, happier, better person than a person with low self-esteem. But if you go to Japan, a person who has high self-esteem will have high blood pressure and poor health and generally not uh, be happy and not have a good job. People in that culture, low self-esteem correlates with health, happiness, and well-being. And in our culture, in the United States culture, the, it's the opposite. So you have something you would assume is a universal good. is not. It's not a universal human quality. It's not a universal human good. It completely depends on the kind of brain that's experiencing it. So if you're going to design a, co a way of teaching students that, or a way of, of conducting business or a way of, of operating your institution or a way of, uh, of delivering political decisions, if you were to think, let's say uh, in a, you had a classroom and, and there's research that did something just like this. You have a classroom of students and you want to encourage them to do better. Do you tell them when they're doing well, do you give them encouragement and say, you're doing a great job. Look how great you did on this, on this, on this test. You can do, you can do that again. You got it. You're going, you're, you're amazing. You can do this. You're a champion. Or do you wait until they make a mistake and then just berate them and say, how, how can you be such an idiot? This, you're, you're failing. You're, you are below average. You're the worst. You're never going to make it in this world. What is wrong with you? I mean, what's the better approach? Well, the answer is it depends on the kind of brain that those students have. And if they are students from Japan, you want to emphasize the um, the, the you want to emphasize when they are falling behind, and you want to give them feedback on when on when they are uh, failing. If you are dealing with students from the United States, you want to emphasize when they're pulling ahead, when they're doing well, and try to encourage their success. So, the answer that is derived from any method, whether it's the scientific method or some other method, is um, it's going to be skewed in the direction of the people that you're talking about. So, and it's weirdly enough, you can follow the scientific method and get your answer. And that answer will not be universal for all human beings. So when it comes to something like self-esteem, it's a great example. Like if you do all the research and the evidence comes out at the end that this is how you should approach this problem in the future, you need to be, you need to recognize that that is true for the kind of brain that is going to be facing this same situation in the future. And it's not necessarily true. And so there's a whole wing of psychology called cultural psychology that yeah. is kind of, it's kind of strangely lived in the, in the background of, a, of even evolutionary psychology and some of the things that are considered, you know, um, speculative, speculative. And we're learning now and a culture can be anything. A culture can be a gender. A culture can be a socioeconomic, uh, you know, strata. A culture can be the hometown you're, you live in versus one just 20 miles away. And so we're starting to understand that even though we've applied the scientific method to psychology and we're trying to be so strict and we're trying our best to, to lean toward replication and to make this as quantified as possible, the results, even of Daniel Kahneman's research, are still um, maybe describing the way that a certain kind of mind works in one region and not in another. And so the next level of work in all of all, res all of that kind of research, all social, all social sciences is to try to determine, is this a universal human property yeah, or is yeah. this a cultural property? So uh, that would be my other caveat to the scientific method is always remember that yes, you're going to get a result and yes, it's going to be true, but it might not be universally true. Yeah. That just makes me think actually of, something that's, that didn't originate in the West, but may have an application to us becoming more aware of, of our biases is, is mindfulness. What are your thoughts regarding the increasing amount of evidence showing the effectiveness of mindfulness training in developing wider awareness? Oh yeah, I, I, I'm a huge advocate of all that. It's the evidence is really strong. Um, the, the benefits are enormous and you know, if you don't want to be, if you look at all of that and it, it kind of gives you pause because it feels like it's too spiritual or too woo woo or too or too <laughs> Calif too California or whatever, um, it's easy to reframe it because it's most neuroscientists would be back would back the idea of mindfulness meditation and mindfulness in general because what you're doing is you're 
you're taking the portion of your if you look at the if you look at the brain as and the mind that it generates as being a sort of a uh, a parliament of competing uh, agencies they're all trying they're all lobbying for control of the organism okay. um, the the executive branch of that um, system that that comes down and says yes or no to everything or or that eventually gives in or can or, or holds tight and doesn't give in mindfulness and meditation that that practices that is a way to for your for you to actually take the conscious part of your brain and give it the power to physiologically alter the non-conscious parts of your brain, which is uh, exciting and, and, and bizarre because you, you're, in a, you know, if, if you learn how to play guitar, you, there's actually a physical correlation to what's happening. I mean, you are, there's, you're physically changing the synaptic connections in your mind, in your brain, yeah. you're, you know, you're, there's a, there's a actual physical thing that's happening. Well, you can do that without, without any uh, object, you can actually just sit down and close your eyes and you can practice the, the act of paying attention to something and, and, um, and the act of, of pushing thoughts aside. And the, the more you do it, the better you get at it. And sure. you actually, you're actually building, you're actually changing the physiological state of your, of your brain. You're, you're affecting the brain matter itself so that you're, you're building a brain through will alone that is better at exercising its will. And that's a pretty amazing thought to me. Like it's just such a strange loop that you can generate on your own. And, and the evidence suggests that it is good. It is real. And it has, it's, it's uh, the benefits are enormous, especially when it comes to decision making. Yeah. And very empowering too. You know, I mean, only 30 odd years ago, we thought we were pretty fixed in our, our brains. Mm. And now the, this whole notion of plasticity uh, just gives people so much encouragement that they can change their lives to an extent, you know, I mean, it, whether you can do a complete vault face about things, but, but, but there's a there's a there's a lot of room for maneuverability, isn't there? There is. I mean, actually, um, my new book that's all that's all it's about is the idea of um, mind change. How 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 you can go from thinking, believing, and acting in one way, and then later in life thinking and acting and believing in another. Like there's the the new book that I'm working on is all about that process and what why minds change how they change and why they don't and what goes into all of that and I think it's you know as a modern human if you deal with a lot of strangers on the internet it starts to become apparent that it's hard to change people's minds and it's really hard to change people's minds by just simply presenting them with evidence to the contrary and yeah. what of whatever it is they're saying and so I've become because of these these other books that I've done I've become like really fascinated with why that is and how it can be whether or not it is actually possible to um, convince somebody that they're incorrect, whether through one conversation or through many. So that's, um, and I'm happy to say that there is a lot of, there's a lot of evidence that points toward, yes, you can do it, but it's really hard and um, it's difficult to do on a large scale without it being extremely expensive. But the fact that the brain is plastic changes a lot of what, a lot of the things that are baked into our institutional understanding of ourselves are just wrong now that we understand how plastic the brain is. Yeah, um, and, and similar to this, I, I don't know if there's a, as a similar initiative in the States, but the, there's a movement in the UK to actually uh, get kids to, to study subjects such as critical thinking uh, and philosophy at an earlier and earlier age for them to question their assumptions more and think more critically about things. What do you think about that sort of initiative and well, what's happening in the States in that regard as well? I think that's fantastic, and no, that's not happening in the states. Uh, we're still trying to convince people that evolution's real. So, um, the, uh, the 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 um, it's slow here. I'm not saying it's you know there's a lot of resistance <laughs> here too. Um, you know, one of the reasons that my first two books, "You Are Not So Smart," "You Are Now Less Dumb," or "How You Can, How to Beat Your Brain," one of the things that made them popular in the United States is because it's so countered to the American, um, uh, you know, psyche. The 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 the, the the way a person in the United States looks at his or herself is in a very positive, optimistic way, uh, and almost ridiculously so. And um, I've enjoyed that the it's the title in the UK is taken so differently than it's taken by someone in the United States. Like a person in the United States wants to beat the book up, you know, like what the hell? Are you? you know, they open it up like how how the hell are you talk about? I'm smart, you know. They they want to prove it wrong, where you know the cheekiness of it comes across in the UK, and. It's which was its original intent, but in America it's taken so differently. So 
I more think of an that insult. It's taken as an insult. <laughs> totally. <laughs> um, this, um, which I think that's one of the best parts of once you are enamored by the scientific method, you know, you start to become enamored by the whole idea of just being wrong. And yeah. you start to, you start to embrace the, the power of um, being honest about your ignorance. Sure. That is something that is, that Americans are slowly, slowly warming to. Okay. Well, What's your understanding of the the middle way, David, and and how might it relate to what we've been talking about today? Well, I'm, I'm I just have a very basic understanding of that world and then those notions, but I think that I may have uh, stumbled into it or backed into it somehow, and um, because my central message and maybe goal of you are not so smart is to express a shared humility and to to express a um, evidence to, to to present evidence that will lead people toward this sort of shared humility and to one of the when I do lectures one of the first things I usually talk to people about is that Capilano Canyon bridge study and you know they had, they had this long suspension bridge like something out of Indiana Jones and they had a um a, they had a woman it was done in the 70s so it's a little sexist but there's a woman in the middle of the bridge an attractive young woman, and she would wait till a man walked by, and she would say, "Excuse me, sir, would you like to uh, take part in a scientific study?" They would always say yes, and then it was real simple. They had to answer a couple questions, look some look at some pictures, and then she would say, "This is my phone number. If you have any questions about this, you know, just give me a call." And so they did that all day, and then they also did the exact same thing on this like short wooden bridge that was not scary in any way this this other bridge they did it on like swayed in the wind and it was a ravine at the bottom it was really scary um so what the way they quantified it the way they measured this was that they asked uh they just measured how often some these how often these men would call that number thinking that she was actually asking the guy on a date and on the suspension bridge 50 percent of the men called it uh called the number thinking that it was uh that she was you know that there was chemistry and uh and on the on the sturdy bridge, only twelve percent of the men did, and they they replicated this in the lab. They did it, you know, making people think they were going to get electric shocks, and, this, and it all bore out. And they call it the misattribution of arousal. Now, the, the way I like to, the reason I like to do that first is because the lesson of this of that study is that all of these people thought they knew why they felt the way they felt. Yeah. And they then made a decision based off of that assumption, and they were very confident in that decision. And they would have lived their entire lives believing that that was that they were right and that it was true and all this stuff. And that's how we live our lives. We live our lives in the dark when it comes to the origins of our thoughts, feelings, and emotions. And we have a – not only do we not realize it, we're very confident that that's not true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, what I hope happens with You Are Not So Smart is that you, you keep hearing more and more examples of that sort of thing until you finally go, okay, I get it. That, yeah. I, that, and I think that there's no other way to be a person after that than something that corresponds with that sort of the philosophy of the middle way or the, or the, the, um, that sort of measured, uh, and, uh, more accurate understanding of how people work, I think leads naturally to that way of seeing things. So. Yeah. Now that's a, that's a great analogy. Um, David, and my last question, if people wanted to find out more about your work, how would they go about it? Uh, well, uh, you can go to youarenotsosmart.com. There's everything there. I, I have a podcast. It comes out every two weeks. I usually pick out a topic and go find some scientists and interview them about that topic. That's every two weeks. Uh, and that's on iTunes and um, SoundCloud and all those places where you find podcasts. And then um, my books are on Amazon and, um, I'm out there on social media, easy to find. I, um, blog is at not smart blog on Twitter. I'm at David McCraney, but you can find everything at you are not so smart.com. And I also put the podcast out over at boing boing.net. Okay. Well, it's been a, a great pleasure talking to you today, David. Uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Oh no. Super pleasure on this end. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.